It's a very uh, fun time to be with you all, uh, and I want to say uh, thank you to those who put together the workshop, all the details and behind the scenes. Uh, you did an excellent job, and sharing the reading this morning of Scripture, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, great. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And so we take a Sunday and we celebrate the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. We carve out a time in the calendar year to say we celebrate Pentecost. This morning you heard read several scriptures, perhaps more than you normally hear, but the emphasis has been on the Holy Spirit Pentecost. And as prayed, may God add his blessing and may he anoint his word afresh today. On behalf of the Mission Society, I uh, just bring you greetings. Uh, we are a sending organization. We have around 200 missionaries in different places. Uh, about 130 of those are in cross-cultural ministries overseas. Uh, some are in cross-cultural ministries here in the States. And we have, uh, at this time I believe we have four of our missionaries on the campus. Wes, what? Help me. Methodists on campus are called Wesley Houses, Wesley Homes, Wesley. Am I in a Methodist church? <laughs> uh, Wesley Campus. Back in Indiana, they use the phrase Wesley Campuses. Anyway, we have about four on campus there. I live in Indiana. Our home base is uh, in Atlanta. When the staff there is around 27. Uh, we have a couple of folks sort of satellite offices in, in, in one of them there. You have in your worship folder a picture? Yes? If you will be very patient this morning, we will get to this picture. So do not get anxious, we will get there. Okay? Um, do any of you enjoy humor? Good humor. Good humor? <laughs> yeah, funny, funny. <laughs> well, look, I mean, I'll tell you at least two, perhaps three, depending on how you respond. The first one is about a wife, the second is about boys, and then the third, if we get to there, is about senior citizens. A wife had invited some people to dinner. At the table, she turned to her six-year-old daughter and said, Would you say the blessing? The little girl said, I won't know what to say. Mom said, just say what you hear your mommy say. Just say what you hear your mommy say. In time to eat, the daughter bowed her head and said, Lord, why on earth did I invite these people to dinner? <laughs> hey, that was a good response. We'll do one more then. <laughs> Three boys are in the schoolyard bragging about their families. This is dedicated to Pastor Dave. The first boy said, My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and he calls it a poem. They give him 50 bucks. The second boy said, That's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and he calls it a song. They give $100. The third boy says, I got all of you beat. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and he calls it a sermon. <laughs> and it takes eight people to collect the money. <laughs> God is good. Amen. All the time. Amen. The scripture passage you have here, we have here in front of us, the beginning of Acts 1, is basically saying that that period of time from when Christ left the ascension to the time of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was promising them, even though I'm leaving, the third person of the Trinity is coming and will be with you. And that is built upon the foundational statements that Jesus had already said. If I go, the Holy Spirit will come. And he will teach you all things. He will lead you into the truth. So Christ had already laid the groundwork, and before he leaves and returns to heaven, he says, be patient and wait. The Holy Spirit will come. And then the second passage we come to talks about being sent. 
Now, the question I want to raise at the beginning of my message, am I truly called to present Jesus to individuals within my network, my sphere of influence? Am I truly called to be a witness? That's one of the primary questions I left out. Do we have audio? We'll try it again. The Bible asks us to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is often a challenging thing to do in our everyday life. Luckily, I know for a fact that the Bible isn't referring to my neighbors. My neighbors listen to loud music all the time and always have people over that sometimes block my driveway. It's obvious God doesn't expect me to love them. I feel I have been called instead to shame them out of their wicked ways with disapproving stares and calls to the police about their music in the middle of the afternoon. It's a ministry I'm quite passionate about. <laughs> but for those of you with neighbors God expects you to love, remember, beyond three houses in each direction, people are not your neighbors. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. <laughs> so I raise up the question, am I truly, does God really truly call me to be a witness for Him? Now, as we look at this second passage here, it comes sort of a, a, a rattling. Something happens in Acts 2. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And the last statement here says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak another tongue as the Spirit enabled them. So we have the celebration of Pentecost today, but 2,000 years ago, as mentioned, the Holy Spirit actually did come. And it was a phenomenon that they had never experienced before. It was something that occurred that no one else had seen, heard, and how could they believe that this was happening in a supernatural way? So thus they thought the people were drunk, as we'll look at the story further. Now there, we're staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews. And at the very last, then how is it that each of us here, we hear them in our native language? A miracle is occurring. And the people, not the 120 together, but the people beyond that circle, they were asking, what in the world is going on? What is happening? In this selection of scripture, Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice. And then he goes to the book of Job, quoting, In the last days God will pour out my spirit on all people. And we had that as our call to worship, right? Right. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So in the ruckus and the confusion and all the, the activity that's going on and people saying, what in the world's happening? Peter stands and he begins to explain what is going on. One of his uh, addresses was, fellow Israel, listen to this. The second one was, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. So he's proclaiming the gospel. He's telling the truth that it stems back into the Old Testament and prophecy has come, uh, fulfilled the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the people heard this, that is to say, when they heard the gospel presented, the words here say they were cut to the heart. I'm not sure how I could express that in your words. But the way in which the Holy Spirit, quote, cuts to my heart is that the Holy Spirit from time to time sort of nudges my heart. Or there's sort of a um that occurs within my body. And I really can't articulate that well. But when the Holy Spirit wants to speak to me, there's just sort of an inner awareness that I either need to say something, uh, do something, pause for prayer, so that when the Holy Spirit's inside of us, active and working, we know that. We're aware of that. And in this case, 
They were cut to their heart, and then they asked the question, what shall we do? And then Peter replied, repent and be baptized, and you will be filled, you will receive, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The second question I raise up this morning is, does it matter if I present Jesus before my friends and co-workers? So they see and learn about God's love and grace and forgiveness. What do you think? Does it matter? Does it matter if we are witnesses? And then ending with the scripture. <clears throat> Those who accepted Peter's message, they were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The end result of what Peter proclaimed, the end result of that was people responded and there was a personal relationship between people and God. So much so that 3,000 people said, I'm in. I'm willing to repent and be baptized. I understand you, Peter. I get it. Does it matter what we say? It sure mattered in the story of the book of Acts, did it not? Does it matter what we say and witness to others today? You see, our gospel is a gospel of hope. It causes us to look forward, to anticipate, to expect the fulfillment of what only God can do, of what God will do in and through us. Would you repeat this last little phrase? Let's go together. Of what God will do in and through us. Isn't that good? What God can do through us. Evangelism is sharing the Word of God with people that haven't heard it. It's an important part of Christian life. So important, in fact, it should only be done by missionaries and pastors, because they are trained professionals. Do you know who begat Elzaphan, or who the Nephilim were? Me neither. What if you're sharing the Word of God and someone asks you these things? You'd look foolish. Just make a list of all the people in your life that need to know God. Give it to your pastor and tell him his work is cut out for him. Then sit back and watch your tithe money at work. Now that's evangelism. These have been deep thoughts from a shallow Christian. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> By the way, you have perhaps 15 or 20 minutes from now until the service is over. So go ahead and get out a piece of white paper and start making your list. And when you greet the pad, you... <laughs> Sorry, baby. It's okay, <laughs> There in our life places, we become primary channels through whom Christ displays His saving power and transforming reign. Um, the word disciple. Is Marcia here in worship this morning? Hey, Marshall. How are you? I'm good. May we chat for a minute? Remember the first question that I asked? Am I truly called to be a witness for Christ? Uh, you would consider yourself a Christian disciple? So we'll put uh, Marsha's name right here. Now, if you would, get out that piece of white paper that has a heart in the very center, then it has some circles around it. If you have a pen or a pencil, I would encourage you just to put your name there. Marsha, if you, it's okay with you, you can put your name on that piece of paper. Is that all right? May I ask you a few questions? You won't get upset. You think she'll get upset? No. Should I embarrass her? Yes. <laughs> uh, Marsha, do you work? Are you gainfully employed? You're not a slacker, right? Voluntary working. Yeah. How about recreation? Yeah. Like what? What kind? Yeah. What kind of recreation? Um, uh, walking, walking, singing. Um, so you're a walker. Loving my children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. Any hobbies? Hobbies. Collections. What do you what? Like symbols. Symbols. Thimbles? Thimbles. 
from all over the world. What would be one of the most unique symbols that you have? The most unique one is the gold one that has my initial on it that was uh, an antique. But I just happened to find Ken Bob had an import. Oh. <laughs> he wanted to or had to? Oh, he felt. He felt. <laughs> Do you do marriage counseling? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Uh, oh, he's collecting thimbles. That's just unique. Cool. Family, you have some family. Yeah. Yeah. How many children? Five children. Any grandchildren? Fifteen grandchildren. <laughs> Two great grandsons. Wow. That's a lot. Do you ever feed them all at once? If you're not, <laughs> you know, not to. Try not to. Uh, how about school? Are you still in kind of continued education? Yes, I am. Sweet. What? What is it? Are there any other nurses in here? Yep. One, two, three, four. A volunteer. You've already said you do some volunteer work. How about do you go to the gym or anything like that and work out? I have a membership. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best, yeah. Have that piece of paper in front of you. Literally, would you hold that up for a minute? Just hold it right there in front of you. Make sure you're seeing it. You could put different things in those circles. One of the things Marsha put in there was collecting thimbles. Another was she's got a membership to a gym, the grandkids, the, the hobby, and all of that. You could put items in your circle, right? The things you do, the place you're employed, and all. Now, catch this. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth, including Samaria. Folks, the question, am I called to be a witness for him? And if so, where? I would suggest our witnessing has to be here and there. The there meeting with our family, our friends, our co-workers, those who potentially work out with us in a gym. That's our network, our sphere of influence. Are you with me? Amen? Yeah. It's just a natural thing. We don't need to go somewhere or get a lot of training. It's just witness where we are. That circle of influence, and all of us have that. How do we connect with our friends so that they connect with Jesus? Isn't that a great question? How can I connect with you so that you can connect with Jesus? I would suggest, first of all, be normal. <laughs> Any abnormal people here? This <laughs> it's 1048. I'm impressed. You guys allow your minister to speak for 40 minutes? That is awesome. And there's no clock. Be normal. How do I share Jesus with this person so that he looks to Christ. One is, that is just to be normal, just to be myself. I don't need to memorize a bunch of scripture and quote all those scriptures to him, but just be normal. Uh, secondly, be real. Uh, isn't it kind of yucky when you run across a Christian that tries to be perfect? They have everything together. It's just kind of like, really? You got it all together? To, to, to just be real. And perhaps the most important part is to listen to key statements. Listen to key statements so you can connect with those folks. That may be real practical. About a month ago, I was playing golf with someone. I knew their name and had said hello, bye a few times. And Rex and I was in a cart playing golf together. And on about hole four, he asked me what I did. And I said, well, I'm a church consultant, and I zero in on mission and outreach and said a few other words. A couple of holes later, as we were driving from uh, the tee down to the fairway, he turned to me and he said, you know, I used to go to church. When I was a kid, I went to church, but the church was a place where I always felt judged and condemned. That was just no fun. He said, I don't go anymore. Do you see the connecting point? I didn't memorize anything. 
I needed prep racks. He just asked me a simple question, and I was just listening for a key statement. I wasn't trained to talk to Rex, it was just a key statement, and that was, I used to go to church, and it was a place where I was judged. Folks, we have the greatest news in the world, that God loves you, and he loves everyone out there, right? And I'm just nudging and encouraging you this morning to consider being an effective witness in your sphere of influence that you have there in front of you as a Christian disciple. And I close with this slide. Well, okay. Would you bow your head with me for a minute? Father, we just... Uh, we just put on the table this morning that we do not fully understand the work of your Holy Spirit. We also confess to you that there's many times that we are intimidated to speak. We're a bit shy to even say the word Jesus to other people. And Father, we confess to you that we know and we have felt your nudges and we've let them pass. Father, this morning in the midst of our confession, we also ask, do it again. Give us another chance. And Father, today, this week, this month, may we have a unique, special encounter with one of our friends, one of our co-workers. And dear Lord, as the Holy Spirit nudges us, this morning we commit to respond the way you want us to. In the name of Christ. And the people said,